Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This is the 50th consecutive episode of the Roundup and the Roundup for the week of the 30th of August to the 5th of September, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. Before getting into this week's news updates, a special shout out to our good friends at GoTikonauts and SpaceWatch.Global, two excellent sources of space industry news. Also a kind reminder that if you like what you see or hear, there's a lot more news information available at our newsletter, which you can find at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. This week, we bring you updates on China's own Martian helicopter, an interesting feature story on Li Shufu and Geely and their space plans. But first, Jean will bring us some updates from the Taiwanese commercial space sector. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Jean, what is going on in your birthplace of Taiwan? <laughs> Yeah, first piece of news for this week. Let's stray a little bit uh, away from mainland China and talk about Taiwan, about a commercial launch company called TI Space, which is short for Taiwan Innovative Space or Taiwan Jinsheng Taikong, and which was founded in May 2016 or in May year 105, if you use the uh, ROC Republican calendar, which is still in use to some extent in, in Taiwan. The company is headquartered in the city of Zhunan, just south of Xinzhu, which is one of Taiwan's central and most important science and technology hubs. The company received this week the authorization from Australian authorities to launch their Hapith-1 suborbital rocket from the South Australian launch complex, the Whalers Way Orbital Launch Complex. And this will be a significant step for the company because the launch of the Hapith-1 suborbital rocket had been postponed for quite some time now. Typically, COVID had delayed one of the launches that were initially planned for February 2020, and also the initial launch site was supposed to be Taidong on the eastern coast of Taiwan, but this was pushed back and just temporarily ruled out due to friction that was happening with Aborigines, as well as environmental concerns. And that was why the launch was moved to Southern Australia. One of the interesting things that we can note about TI Space, other than being just yet another, um, you know, small lift launch company out there, is that they're using specific propulsion technology, uh, namely hybrid propulsion. In the space sector, we are used to hearing solid about solid field rockets where the oxidizer and the fuel are basically solid and pre-mixed um, together in one block. We also hear a lot about liquid field rockets where you have two liquid, you know, uh, the oxidizer and the fuel that are kept separate in a liquid state in different tanks. But you also have uh, a middle ground, which is hybrid propulsion, where you have a liquid oxidizer. In the case of TI space, it's nitrous oxide. Um, and you also have a solid fuel. So some um, locally produced rubber-based propellant in the case, again, of TI space. Hybrid propulsion engines have existed for quite some time now, usually at an R&D level. They've been seldom used in actual commercial launch vehicles. It does have probably some disadvantages. I believe it's in terms of how you can control the combustion. But some people, some supporters would say that it actually is the best of both worlds between solid and liquid. And just to give you a few examples of the arguments that are put forward, uh, hybrid propulsion is much more simple in terms of the piping systems uh, compared to liquid fueled rockets because you only have one liquid propellant. So, you know, all these circuits are much more simple. You don't necessarily have to rely on turbo pumps, et cetera, et cetera. In the case of TI space, they are able to simplify the engine enough to just use pressure fed systems on their Lalian 1 engine. So you're reducing the complexity, you're reducing the number of pieces, you're reducing also the risks of failure. Another advantage of hybrid propulsion, this time compared to solid fuel propulsion, is that you can basically you can shut off and control the thrust of the engine by controlling the mass flow rate of the liquid propellant. And this is not something that you can do with solid propulsion because, you know, the, the, the fuel and the oxidizer are premixed. So basically when you ignite that, it just burns until the end and you cannot shut the engine off. A final advantage, again, to hybrid propulsion compared to um, solid fuel rockets is that solid fuel rockets, again, they have their oxidizer and their fuel Premixed, and so when you're transporting this rocket around, basically you're moving around a bomb. Uh, in the case of uh, hybrid propulsion, since they're kept separate, you have much fewer constraints in terms of transporting this rocket to the launch site. 
So TI Space plans to use its hybrid propulsion technology in the Lalian 1 engines, which will power the Hapith 1 suborbital two-stage rocket, as well as the Hapith 5 orbital three-stage rocket. The Hapith 5 rocket, we know that this rocket will be expendable, which probably makes sense for a small hybrid rocket, considering that the rocket is much cheaper to produce due to the little machinery that's involved in hybrid propulsion, uh, or at least compared to liquid fuel rockets. We also know that the Hapith 5 will be able to put 390 kilograms into LEO. Final point on my side, the CEO Chen Yen Sun, uh, who's an ex-Taiwanese space agency rocket scientist who also worked for a NASA in the past, I believe. He mentioned in 2019 that he was aiming for a launch cost of six to seven million US dollars, which puts the cost per kilogram at around 15,000 plus US dollars, which is which is quite okay, but I'm not sure that this will be enough considering the competition that will be extremely stiff on the small lift launch vehicle landscape. And you also have to note the fact that Taiwan has very little internal demand for launch to support uh, this small lift launch vehicle. Chen, nevertheless, he mentions that the company plans to bring the cost down further due to the simplicity of the architecture of uh, the Lalian 1 engines. He also mentions that the price will naturally go down as the production ramps up and the economies of scale kick in. So overall, I'm very excited to see some commercial activity build up in Taiwan. Taiwan is definitely a new player in the commercial space sector and the commercial launch sector. So uh, we'll have to see where that goes, but I'm pretty convinced that we'll see the suborbital launch of the Hapith 1 rocket take place from Australia before the end of the year. Definitely exciting stuff and uh, always good to not be uh, having to carry a bomb from Taiwan to Australia and to have a, a different way of doing that. And I'd never heard of the uh, the Taiwanese Republican calendar, so interesting to know. Uh, so just a couple of points to add to um, to Jean's discussion about the Taiwanese space sector more generally. Um, so first, I definitely, uh, you know, to your earlier point, John, uh, Taiwan is a relatively new player in the space sector and in particular the commercial space sector. So the National Space Program has been around for a little while with the, the Formosat uh, series of, of weather satellites, among other things, but commercial space still very new. That being said, Taiwan does have several distinct advantages that are likely going to help them carve out a niche in the rapidly growing global commercial space sector. So chief among these advantages is the fact that Taiwan is arguably an, the world leader in semiconductor manufacturing, an area that is becoming increasingly important, not just for the space sector, but for basically all sectors. And so we have the local powerhouse, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, or TSMC, which is not only one of the world's most valuable companies, but most probably the most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturer in the world. And separate to TSMC, you have a, you know, several dozen other highly advanced, uh, smaller, although still highly advanced, semiconductor manufacturing companies. And indeed, we did see in an interview from June of this year with the acting director general of Taiwan's National Space Organization, uh, Mr. Yu Xianzheng, uh, who noted that around a dozen Taiwanese companies are already providing uh, semiconductors and other components and ground-based equipment for SpaceX and their Starlink constellation. So again, uh, in addition to the launch company TI Space that John has discussed, there is this sort of nascent emerging Taiwanese commercial space sector that is coming out of the kind of semiconductor sector, which is one of their historical competencies. And also at the time of that interview, we saw a Minister of Science and Technology, uh, Wu Tsung Tong, who noted that Taiwan has existing capabilities that will make them competitive at building low Earth orbit satellite components, uh, which they see as a major opportunity and one that, according to Wu, Taiwan, in quote, uh, cannot definitely cannot afford to miss, says Wu. And so I think it's, it's important to note that the recent space activity in Taiwan has been fueled in part by the Space Development Promotion Act, which uh, was found, uh, was passed in, in May of 2021. So the Taikong Fa And uh, this act covers four areas. So namely one, uh, the setting principles of development that are aligned with international space laws. Two, regulating space-based activities <clears throat> to ensure safety, so no bombs. Uh, three, establishing rocket launch sites. And four, promoting industrial development. So overall, I think, you know, safe to say the Taiwanese space sector remains relatively small, but also very specialized. And I do think that moving forward, there are clearly some pretty unique advantages and competencies uh, that are going to be helping to propel the sector. And it does seem like more recently, these advantages and, and competencies have been met by additional government support for the, the Taiwanese space sector, as it were. And so, um, yeah, I think moving forward, it's going to be very interesting to see how the sector develops and particularly given the extent to which a lot of these very big uh, Taiwanese companies have a significant amount of business in both mainland China and the West. So they're kind of uh, having one foot in both of these 
increasingly um, adversarial <coughs> worlds, as it were. Uh, so, Sean, unless you have anything else on the Taiwanese space sector, maybe we shall move into uh, China's Martian helicopter. Absolutely. Let's move on to the other side of the strait. Is China developing its own version of Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter that NASA put on Mars a couple of months ago in the context of the Mars 2020 mission? So to answer that question, let's discuss the following piece of news. China's National Space Sciences Center, the NSSC, which is under the Chinese Academy of Sciences, they revealed earlier this week that on August the 20th, three projects passed an acceptance test review. And among these projects was one that was named the Mars Surface Patroller and Remote Sensing Key Technology Study, or And this latter project, led by Professor Bian Chuanjiang of the NSSC's Key Laboratory of Electronics and Information Technology for Space Systems, included a Mars UAV as well as its remote sensing payload. And I think the most interesting thing to note about this prototype when we look at the images that were put out there was that this UAV seems to have gone for the same lift generating mechanisms as um, Ingenuity, namely that is two contra-rotating rotors and even the rest, to be honest, the payload bay and also the four landing legs, to some extent, they look quite similar. And I think that this technical solution makes absolute sense and is really fitting for Mars. And that's because while the Martian atmosphere is much is much thinner than on Earth. I think we're at 4 or 5% of the atmospheric pressure that we have on Earth. And this means that the rotors will have to be larger for a given rotation speed in order to generate the same amount of lift. And that is not something that you want because, uh, first of all, your rotor is bulkier, it's heavier, and potentially the tips of the blades have a higher chance to pass, you know, reach supersonic speeds. And that is not something you're looking for due to the disadvantages of the transonic regime. And this is where contra rotating rotors really shine because they have the advantage of producing higher lift for a given rotor diameter. They enable more compact designs. And this, these are all things that you're looking for when you're designing a Mars UAV. On a side note, I'd, I, I'd add that there were many remarks on social media saying how, you know, how NSSC was copying NASA's concept, which is relatively unfair, although that's my personal opinion. And to illustrate that, first of all, contra rotating rotors, as mentioned, is an optimal solution for Mars. Um, and while NASA definitely did it first, they demonstrated the viability of the solution. And that is absolutely fantastic. Kudos to NASA for that. I don't think that that means that other countries, maybe China or just any other country, are not allowed to go for a similar solution for their remote sensing drone. An example I'd give is, you know, Henry Ford put four wheels on his Model T automobile. That doesn't mean that Mitsubishi, Nissan or Land Rover can't do the same. A second point is that contra-rotating rotors are a well-established technology. This is not a new technology on ingenuity. It's been under, it's understood and it's been used for quite some time now. I'd give some few examples, such as the Tupolev 95 bomber from the Soviet Union that was designed in the 1950s and that's still operational today. It uses contra-rotating rotors, although in a different context. You also have the Kamov Ka-50 attack helicopter. And you also have examples in the industrial drone sector using contra-rotating rotors and for similar reasons as NASA's Ingenuity. And I'd give an example of the French ECA IT-180-120. Um, Finally, the Chinese have been known to be working on a Mars UAV for quite some time now. And reading an article that was written by space journal journalist Andrew Jones over the past week, he mentions that the Beijing Institute of Spacecraft uh, System Engineering, Aerospace Dongfang Hong in Shenzhen, Beihang University, as well as the Qin Fishun Laboratory of Space Technology, all of these labs have been studying aerial concept architectures for uh, Mars exploration for quite some time now. And personally, I did the, you know, the test myself. I went on Baidu, typed Mars UAV in Chinese and looked up some of the papers that, you know, came to the surface. And you realize that you have various Chinese Aerospace Research Institute papers coming from HIT or NUAA, the Nanjing University of Astronautics and Aeronautics that date back already five to 10 years ago and that have um, that are discussing Mars UAV architectures. So there is some precedence as well on the Chinese side. Basically, in the nutshell, the U.S. has undeniably been the, you know, the, the, the pioneering spacefaring country here. Uh, but China is also doing some quite respectable space stuff. So we shouldn't take that away from them, probably. Um, and yeah, that's probably how I'll conclude this uh, this part. I think it's likely that now the U.S. has demonstrated the viability 
of a Mars drone that we see more and more drones that are sent out there to explore not just Mars, but also other, you know, other planets that have an atmosphere that are able to sustain such a, you know, an aerial vehicle. Well, that's a tough act to follow, Martian helicopters, but I'll do my best. So for our last piece of news this week, we have a very interesting article uh, on Geely Group and in particular the company's chairman, Li Shufu. And so we saw this article published by Reuters uh, earlier this week, and it was basically a deep dive into Li Shufu, Zhejiang Geely Holdings Group, and the company and chairman's ambitions for turning this company from an auto manufacturer into an autonomous mobility service provider with a certain space component to that business plan. And I would argue, uh, first of all, that Li, uh, Li Shufu and Geely are arguably the closest thing that China has to an Elon Musk and Tesla, and their story is nearly as impressive as, uh, as Musk's and, and Tesla's. So just a very short review. Uh, Geely is one of the leading commercial automakers in, in China. So most of the automakers are, are state-owned or are joint ventures between foreign companies and state-owned companies. Geely, uh, rather, perhaps no longer unusually, but uh, they were one of the early commercial automobile manufacturers in China. And they have since done quite well. So they, today they own, among others, Volvo, Proton, Lotus, and then a fairly large stake in, uh, in Daimler as well. And so in recent years, we've seen the chairman, Li Shufu, increasingly pushing to transform the company from an automobile manufacturer into the aforementioned autonomous mobility service provider, ushering in a world of self-driving cars and potentially drones uh, that are enabled by, among other things, low Earth orbit satellites that can provide enhanced navigation services and potentially some communication services as well. So this allows for more accurate uh, autonomous vehicles, as, as the, the logic would go. Uh, and so the company's space efforts, uh, so again, this is Geely, the, the parent company has space efforts in a subsidiary, uh, which are primarily concentrated in Guangzhou and then a couple of other cities. And the sort of the main space subsidiary is a company called Shikong Tanswo. Um, I don't know if there is an English name, but we can, we can get back to you on that. And this company was discussed in quite a bit more detail in the Dongfang Hour episode 27. And so the article this week looking at Geely talked a little bit about their space ambitions, but also provided a bit of a deeper dive into the company's early days and basically how did this commercial automobile manufacturer end up becoming one of the world's largest and, and now arguably the closest thing that China has to a Tesla and Elon Musk. And so just to give a very brief summary of the company's early days, it was created in the late 1990s when Chairman Li convinced a local party leader that it was very simple to manufacture cars, essentially referring to them as two sofas on four wheels. And subsequently, he acquired the necessary licenses to produce cars. And uh, this sounds very much like China in the late 1990s. He made it very clear to the local officials that this venture will cost the state nothing and asked him to, I quote here, and I don't know if this is an actual quote, but it was a quote in the article, at least give me the chance to fail, said Chairman Li. And fail he did not. So throughout the 2000s, Geely became more established in China, eventually becoming, as I mentioned, one of the country's leading commercial automakers. And at the dawn of the 2010s, Geely started to expand its global presence, initially through the purchase of Swedish automaker Volvo. And in a great example of China's overlapping stakeholders and the way they interact with one another, and that can also probably be applied to the space context as well, the purchase of Volvo was apparently primarily funded by low-interest loans from the cities of Chengdu and Daqing, uh, da as well as the Jiading district of Shanghai. And in a kind of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type of situation, we later saw Volvo under Geely ownership build factories in both Chengdu and Daqing and an R&D center in the Jiading district of Shanghai. And so providing a boost to probably to the local economies of these places, and in a way, perhaps rewarding them for the relatively easy credit that they had extended to Geely. And you'd have to imagine that today, if Geely went back to Chengdu or Daqing or Jiading and asked them for an additional low interest loan to go do something, they might get a positive answer due to having you know, come back and made right on, uh, on the favor that was given to them before. And so then as we've moved into the later part of the 2010s, we've seen topics such as self-driving cars become increasingly important, not just in China, but also you know, around the world. And Geely has positioned itself as a leader of what you could conceivably call a kind of self-driving car consortia. And so basically, the company has attempted to cultivate what they call a, quote, circle of friends, which is to say OEMs from different countries that can cooperate with Geely and share some of the significant upfront costs required to build things like, you know, the software that would power autonomous vehicles. And so the company built roughly a 9% stake in Daimler for this very purpose, basically to try to cooperate with the Germans to develop autonomous cars, saying that uh, with Lee saying 
there is the need for, quote, smarter and more collaborative investments for OEMs. We've seen other automakers, as well as the German government, be a little bit skeptical about these efforts. But as the article this week points out, uh, the competition in this case is Tesla, which has a market capitalization of 725 billion U.S. dollars, which is to say larger than all of the other automakers combined. And so it may indeed be helpful, if not necessary, for these automakers to create this circle of friends rather than competing with one another and all developing their own independent self-driving vehicle software and related uh, technology. So unclear as to how that will end up going, but this is the idea with Geely. And just a couple of points to, final, uh, to, to finish up on, then I'll turn it over to Jean. Um, so in 2017, after Geely revealed their stake in Daimler, the company sent a delegation to Germany uh, to discuss their plans for collaboration. And that was the first time, as far as I can tell, that Chairman Lee brought up the low Earth orbit satellite constellation idea. And at the time, and even still now, it's in its relatively early stages. Uh, but basically, Geely has plans to manufacture and launch a constellation of hundreds of low Earth orbit satellites that would be used for enhanced navigation and potentially communications. And they built a satellite factory in Taizhou, Zhejiang province, and another factory in Shandong province. And also their <clears throat> aforementioned uh, Shikong Tanswa uh, company, which is headquartered in the Nansha district of Guangzhou. And I think Probably, and the company has mentioned that they plan to use their sort of automotive manufacturing experience to apply it to commercial space. And the company has shown a fair amount of financial heft. They did buy China's first commercial satellite manufacturer, Space OK, in a deal that also saw Geely acquire some technology from the Chinese Academy of Sciences from which Space OK was spun out. So they did, it's, as far as I know, one of the few examples of a Chinese commercial space company being bought. Um, and we've also seen, as I mentioned earlier, Lee and Geely have the ability to raise funds from city and provincial governments for these big, ambitious projects, and they have an ability to follow through and, and deliver on the promises they would make to such governments. And so I think, you know, having a space program is most probably Lee's most ambitious plan that he has ever done. Uh, but if history is any indicator, I think that Geely and Lee have uh, possibly the best chance of any company in China to become the Chinese version of, let's say, Elon Musk and Tesla, although I don't necessarily know if that makes it a good chance or not. But um, speculation aside, John, anything from your end on, uh, on Geely or Li Shufu or, or mm. Chengdu and Daqing? I, I think the story of Li Shufu and Geely are, are really fascinating. They're really at the intersection of, um, you know, autonomous driving of AI of the automobile industry and which make it really uh, a potential Elon Musk uh, candidate indeed. Um, I want to add some updates on the recent developments for the company G Geely, but also its subsidiary Yeespace. Um, so for the coming months, uh, for one, the company is rumored to launch its first satellites by the end of this year. So it'd be the GSAT 1A and the GSAT 1B on board a Kwaijo 1A rocket. And these satellites would be providing centimeter level positioning services to terminals on the ground, notably in automotive and marine and UAV applications. They would also provide cloud and data processing services to those aforementioned industries. Also, in the context of the development of autonomous driving, Geely has also been conducting a series of tests of RTK PPP technology, which is basically a high accuracy hybrid technology combining RTK, I think, which stands for real time kinematic and which relies on ground stations. You also have PPP, which is precise point positioning, this time relying on satellites. When you put those together, you have RTK PPP that enable a centimeter level positioning. And this is a level of accuracy that's likely required if you're trying to do autonomous driving, as opposed to, I think, the meter level accuracy when we're talking about uh, consumer level SatNav chips that you have, for example, in your smartphone. Geely has also been testing remote driving, combining the aforementioned positioning technology, as well as the low latency of 5G. And finally, in a different trial that was unveiled a couple of weeks ago, we also saw Geely test a high bandwidth satellite internet on board uh, one of their cars, the Lincoln Co., which is basically a a high-end Geely car where a flat panel antenna was, was clearly visible on top of the car. On a final note, I never know if you're supposed to say Geely or Geely, Geely being more the Chinese pronunciation, I, I guess. Yeah, that's a fair question. And I honestly have no clue, but I, I tend to say Geely, although I, yeah, Geely is indeed uh, rather closer to the Chinese pronunciation. So 
if any of if anyone out there has any definitive answers, uh, we're all ears. Uh, that being said, uh, nothing else from my side. So, Jean, if we're all good from your side as well, uh, we can say this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This is the 50th consecutive episode and the episode for the week of the 30th of August to 5th of September 2021. And for a bunch of additional insights, I would recommend that you check out the Dongfang Hour newsletter, which is available at newsletter.dongfanghour.com, and which includes, on average, probably 10 additional stories every single week delivered to your inbox at 6 p.m. China time, noon Central European time, 6 a.m. Eastern time every Monday. Uh, yeah, anything else from your side, John? I think we're all good. If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to support us, don't forget to like, subscribe, and interact with us in the comment section below. If you're a company, we also do some consulting work, so you can contact us at contact at dongfanghour.com if that's something you're interested in. Apart from that, I'm Jean Deville of the Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in next week's episode. See you next time. <laughs>